Okay, so I'm going to continue talking about the epsilon delta proof of limits. And I showed you this illustration before, so now you understand what the limit of a function is, you know, what your delta tolerance is, what your epsilon tolerance is. Okay, so now it's time to actually do a proof here. And again, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to what I have to say. So you're going to end up with something that looks like this. Prove that the limit of a function, in this case here, x squared plus 3x equal 18 as x approaches 3. You'll start off, or at least a problem may present itself like this. Given epsilon greater than 0, you're going to find a delta that makes this statement right here true. So basically what you're doing is you're going to find a delta, and then you're going to check it. Okay, now before we do that, I have to show you something. Colorful, right? Okay, so this basically, that function came from a figure like this, you know, where you have the area of a square box is 18 square units, and that the width is x and the length is x plus 3. So the question could be a simple algebra problem like the length of a box is 3 inches longer than the width, which results in this equation here, which is equal to 18, which is represented by this graph over here. And if you plug a 3 in, that's where the 18 comes from. Okay, so at the point 3.1, this graph leads to a point right here with an epsilon tolerance of 0.91 because, you know, 3.1 inside this function gives you 18.91. And what you're taught is given this equation here, you know how you normally solve it, you know, x squared plus 3x equal 18. Well, think of the equal sign kind of like a straw. And the 18 basically is like a balloon with a certain amount. And on the other side, you have a, another balloon with another amount. And you're basically kind of squeezing everything on one side. That's what setting equal to zero is. And this equation here is illustrated by this graph over here. Okay, which is a different graph that shows you the roots of this parabola, which turn out to be the solution to the equation. So in this case here, since x minus x equal negative 6 is not an answer, but an extraneous one for this geometric figure, as you were taught, x is equal to 3. Now, you see x plus 6 and x minus 3. I think the main reason why a lot of people don't understand these epsilon delta problems is because they're not understanding what's actually becoming 0, because if you did understand what becomes 0, you would understand what relationship this has with the epsilon that you that you have over here. So imagine that this equaling zero are two binomials that are the sides of another box. This one down here that I have. Where you have x plus six on this side as I show here and x minus three on this side as I show here. What's actually becoming zero is this gap right in here that I'll put in this color hot pink right here. Okay, it's this gap inside of here that fills up this area. Okay. What's actually becoming zero is actually this gap down here. Okay. And by filling up the area of this box here, as it approaches three, the area between here becomes zero. Now, if it goes past a little bit, that becomes the delta to this original problem here. And what happens is, as the number goes past a 3, that means if I plug a 3 into here, it's equal to 0. So if I go past it a little bit, like 3.1, in that case, that 3.1 gets put inside of here, and I get the delta, which is 0 0.1. In that case, that same 3.1 can be put inside of here, which will yield me a 9.1. Okay, so that means I'd be right around here somewhere. Okay, a little bit higher. So, anyway, the reason I'm showing that I'm going up to the 10 is because you'll see that this 10 is going to play uh, an importance in the future. But for right now, pretend that I'm at 9.1 and it's going like right around here somewhere, right? This line is going right around there. So it's only about this high, really. Okay? But check this out. You see this delta? You see how I made this red rectangular figure here? Well, this delta times this bound which is the x plus 6, is equal to the area of this box right here, which is the epsilon. So therefore, delta really is epsilon over your bound. It'll always work out this way. Now, when you're doing the proofs, you know how you use that 1 
as some type of uh, number that you use on the inequality. Well, that's actually a scaling number. It's it represents it actually does represent a, a unit of measurement right here where I have this delta. It's actually representing just a unit of measurement that's going to get broken down. You see, because if it goes past a little bit farther here, it goes to four, right? Which goes, which basically, if it goes to four, that means that this x here, which is not the same x as this one, it's just a different type. I'm just using this as a placeholder. It becomes, it becomes a, a, a one. If I plug a four into here, this becomes one. That is where you have the whole like, you know, x minus three equal one, or x minus a is less than one, which is less than delta. Okay, if it was equal to delta, you would get the delta back by doing the whole proof. In this case here, when you're doing the proof, you're not really using numbers. Instead, you're using delta, which represents any positive number, and epsilon, which is any positive number. But just remember this figure right here. You may have to watch this a couple times in order to understand. And like I said, you know, this is not something you can learn in like 10 minutes. This is, you know, something you ha it takes a couple days Sometimes it takes people a lot longer than that just to understand the idea, but basically um, I'm trying to illustrate here different aspects of this proof. And remember this, when they're asking you to prove something, it's kind of like they're asking you to prove that the car works. Except instead of just turning on the car by turning the key, you're actually opening up the hood and showing that the battery's connected and that there's gas in the gas tank. So basically when you're given a limit equation to which you have to prove, you're actually doing a lot more than just plugging in numbers you actually have to show some of the inner workings and part of the proof itself which usually is not explained in the books to its fullest extent has to do with a lot of the inner workings that you're seeing here the transformation of the different aspects of the problem you have and the equation how it transforms to a bound times some type of factor and how x approaches a certain number and actually goes past it which produces the delta that you need in order to be able to uh, get the right epsilon. Okay, so now let me go and do this problem up here. Okay, so what you want to do first is you want you've already given this epsilon is greater than zero, so you need to find a delta. So to do that, what you would do is state this. First of all, let, in this case here, x minus 3 less than delta. Now, you can go ahead and write the 0 uh, less than absolute x minus a, which is x minus 3. You can write that, but I'm just leaving that out because some people ask for it, others really don't. In some books you may have it, while others don't have it, so I'm not going to really bother putting it in, but you can if you want. And what you're going to do is find the delta. Well, the delta will be found in, in this equation right here by subtracting the function uh, and the limit. Okay, so let's do that first. So let x minus 3 be less than delta. Then, now, you don't have to write, you know, the then. You, could always, you can kind of just leave it out. Just go straight to here. x squared plus 3x minus 18 is less than epsilon and to kind of save time here I'm just gonna go ahead and jump to you know the two absolutes x plus 6 times x minus 3 is less than epsilon so since this is my delta right here this this is what I'm gonna do next I'm basically gonna bound it so x minus 3 dropping the absolute bars is less than 1 so remember I was telling you about that scaling factor, that 1? That's, this, that's what that is. If this was point 0.1, then after everything's said and done, I'll get my original uh, delta back. But in this case here, if you use 1, which is something bigger, then that means your bound will get bigger. So let me show this to you again right down here. You see, if if you put a 1 in that inequality, basically it's stating that this x minus 3, like you saw in the inequality, is less than 1. Well, in this case here, if it's 0.1, the delta, which is this, is 0.1, okay? Then in that case, what's going to end up happening is, if you use a 1, then this scaling factor goes up to 10, and you'll see why. And so if you're dividing epsilon by 10, it becomes smaller.